Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, the trans issue is one of the dominant issues and debates of our time, but it generates a hell of a lot of noise and very, very little light. So I'm delighted today that my guest is Professor Kathleen Stock, who's just written this book, Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. It's been hugely well reviewed. Um, and she's with me now. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for coming on. Um, at the beginning of the book, you refer to yourself or ha having been described as a bit of a heretic. Uh, what is the nature of your particular heresy? I think I've got multiple uh, heresies going on. Um, I mean, one is that, I mean, the main one is, I suppose, just to cut to the absolute chase, is that I don't think it's literally true that trans women are women and trans men are men and that non-binary people are neither men nor women. I mean, of right. course, that's not going to seem like a heresy to a large number of people listening. It's going to seem like truism, but mm. there is a group of people for whom it is a heresy. So that's that's one of them. The other area in which I think I'm thought of, I don't know if her heretical is the right word, but I, I am a sort of outsider to the whole gender area and and in a way, I think that's given me many advantages mm. um, in being able to try and work out for myself what's supposed to be going on. In the book, which I found extremely clarifying, uh, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, if you don't mind, uh, some of this might seem like, you know, very sort of nuts and bolts to you. But I think that uh, it will be very, very helpful to people. It certainly was to me listening. Um, you make this basic distinction, or rather, should I say, the main issue seems to be around this basic distinction between sex and gender, doesn't it? Could you, ex could you explain that difference? Okay, well, it's, it, as I say in the, towards the beginning of the book, um, sex is understood by me and by many, obviously, in its traditional sense as a biological state. Um, gender, unfortunately, is a word that is now being come to um, mean various different things, completely different things in some cases. Yeah. So when you get an argument about gender, you quite often get people talking past each other. I mean, for some people, gender is just a polite word for sex. Yes. Because they don't want to say the word S-E-X. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then in the, in the original distinction, as it was made in the mouths of... Um, 70s feminists or 60s and 70s feminists last century gender was the social meanings around sex which seems to me a perfectly reasonable distinction to make there's the biological state and then there's how that biology kind of um it has causal effects in the social world right. so that would be masculinity and femininity and it can vary from culture to culture to some extent or to a radical extent depending on whether you think some things are hardwired or not but you know pink being associated with femininity and blue being associated with masculinity that's culturally contingent but it would fall under gender the social associations stereotypes meanings of sex now um things have moved on since then so now there's two sort of significant developments for this argument i think uh one is um a quite strange move made in some academic circles where they want to say that womanhood, womanhood and manhood are genders, but in a so, understood in a social sense. Right. So now womanhood and manhood themselves are no longer biological states. They no longer re just sort of synonymously refer to adult human females and adult human males. Um, they refer to a sort of social role probably associated with femininity or masculinity. That's a weird move, but it does get made. And then um, at the moment, the big hot topic and, the, and really the, um, the, the meaning of gender that's most common, I think, in policymaking is gender identity. 
Yeah. And that's really the target of the book. So this is the idea that really, I mean, I try and go through several different accounts of gender identity to work out what that really is supposed to be, but it's something psychological. So it's an inner state. It's not about your presentation, what you've done to your body. It's not about your biology. It's not, it's not about how other people see you even. It's something inner, the, the way you experience yourself in relation to manhood or womanhood, maleness and femaleness. And what we're seeing in the UK, as you possibly know, is um, a really quite radical reorganisation of social spaces and um, data collection mm. and people's understanding of the self in terms of this thing, gender identity. So that's really the target of the book. Yes, uh, this gender identity, what is the uh, legal status of it at the moment, Kathleen, in the sense that I do obviously know that uh, gender reassignment uh, was a protected characteristic, was it not, under the Equality Act 2010. Um, gender identity, which is the, the new, newest development, um, is that, does that have any legal status? No, uh, well, only derivatively. So it's not specified in the Equality Act. Mm. It's re gender reassignment, i.e. a process. Um, it doesn't have to be a surgical process either. I mean, actually, in the Equality Act, gender reassignment is rather loosely defined anyway. Um, and in the Gender Recognition Act, the subject is gender reassignment. There is um, uh, moves to make hate crime legislation um, directed towards uh, kind of offence against gender identity. So it's in the air, but the our, our sort of main national lobbying groups ostensibly on behalf of gay and trans people, for instance Stonewall, are very keen to see gender reassignment replaced with this idea of gender identity. I see. Why are they actually, Cathy? If you take Stonewall and if you take Mermaid, you, you actually, what, what you, uh, you go through in the book is, you, first of all, you know, that the government uh, or parts of our bureaucracy or whatever seem to be very much enthralled to these groups. And, um, but they use a lot of hyperbole, do they not? Yes, they do. They do. Well, why? I mean, in answer to your question, why are they so focused on gender identity? I think there's a sort of pseudo logical reason. And then there's a kind of more, more um, a, a, a reason more connected to their motives. But, you know, the pseudo logical reason is if you say, OK, um, trans people being trans is not just a matter of having surgery because lots and lots of trans people these days don't. And right. some of them have no. I mean, some are on waiting lists, but some of them don't want to make massive changes to their bodies um so you say okay so it can't be surgery and perhaps it's not even dress because you get sort of <laughs> non-conforming trans people who don't want to fit into the one or other category you know and sometimes you could have a day off and you don't feel like dressing a certain way and so so they're now hunting around for something well what is it that makes you trans oh it must be this inner state that's mm. persistent whether you dress a certain way or move your body you know um yeah change your body a certain way so there's a kind of weird stripping back to what they assume is the kind of essential property of transness now i don't think that works philosophically you know in terms of motives why are they so focused on gender identity well i mean arguably they've done everything they could do stonewall in terms of gay rights and on a legal level so they need a new revenue stream. <laughs> so, right. I mean, that's a more cynical <laughs> explanation. Always comes down to money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's given them a huge boost in terms of profile, mm. in terms of projects all over the place, because, of course, if you're going to try and reconstruct um, any area where sex was formerly relevant as a distinction, you know, so which would include public spaces, data collection, um, health, education, if you're going to try, you know, that's a massive project to replace any talk of sex with gender identity. It's going to keep you going for years. So. Would, it be a, would it be a caricature to say that your, that your view is similar, for example, to Jermaine Greer's, Kathleen? I mean, in, in, the, in the essential feature that I yeah. learned at the beginning, I would say yes. I mean, Jermaine has been, I don't know Jermaine, so I don't know why I'm calling her Jermaine, <laughs> but, you know, I'll talk as if I do know her. Um, she's been uh, vilified for making exactly the same point in a more mm. colourful manner. Um, mm. So has Julie Bindle, yeah. uh, various other people have too. And I think that's outrageous. I mean, I think they are, they are a set, 
actually um, stating what they believe. They have reasons for it. I think they're right. Um, and why shouldn't they express it in a colourful way? Um, it may not be re that respectful, but it's they certainly don't um, deserve the kind of hounding that they've had. And, they, and I think this connects in with another aspect of the book, which is w when I go into the nature of the fiction involved, I think it's a fiction that um, trans women are literally women. And I think, therefore, there can be a whole lot of outrage around exposing that as a fiction, because that's something to do with the nature of fiction. We don't want to know that it's not true. <laughs> so... Yes. That is actually your background uh, discipline, isn't it? Uh, it's not actually, it hasn't been this area, has it? Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, I've spent most of my philosophical life um, writing about imagination, fiction and pretense in a sort of literary context or artistic context. But um, it seems to me, and it has always seemed to me really clear that when people say, I have changed sex, or, you know, I used to be a, a man and now I'm a woman, or I was never a man, <laughs> you know, even when, mm. before I transitioned, I was really a woman. Now, some of them believe those statements literally, but not all of them do. And I think they're engaged in a perfectly reasonable and understandable human practice, which is immersing yourself in a fiction for various purposes you might have. None of them need be sinister. I mean, I think we get involved in fictions all the time as humans. So I try to explain what I think the value of that might be, but also what some of the pitfalls might be as well. We're hearing um, a, a, at the moment quite a few uh, instances, well, they're pretty much always in the news, about uh, changing rooms and, 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 and things like this on, a, on, on an everyday basis. But um, there are particular ways in which this really affects women, aren't there? I mean, could you explain to us, obviously we know, you know, we have had examples of a man who identified as a woman being put in a woman's jail and then assaulting the women, this sort of thing. Um, and also what, I, what is uh, extraordinary to me is that we, we've got, we're getting cases now, for example, there was a student in Dundee recently who, who just happened to say, in fact, I would say what you say, which is that it's a biological fact, um, and uh, apparently has been virtually cancelled, at least in the confines of the university. Uh, women are becoming the victims, victims of this very thing, are they not? Yes, and so I think those are different issues but related. So if I take the space issue first, um, you know, women are overwhelmingly the uh, victims of sexual assault. It's just a basic statistic and it's derived from partly from the fact that men are on average bigger and stronger than women and, have a heter and many of them have a heterosexual interest in women and therefore it's obviously beneficial to women to have spaces where you know as a as a rule of thumb anyone who looks male entering can be um called out and said no sorry you're in the wrong place because that's a, a way we can't police you know changing rooms and bathrooms on a mm -hmm. national level we have to have social norms that allow women to say you don't belong here relatively firmly now what we have um in thanks to stonewall advising national organizations that gender identity is the sort of um, kind of almost a moral reason why uh, males with female gender identity should be allowed into women's spaces. Um, the policies in many, many organizations now say you can self-identify your way into whichever space fe feels to you the right one. They, you know, they explicitly say this as part of their policies. Now, that's a recipe for disaster, I think, in terms of the original purposes for which these spaces were set up. The only reason we're not seeing more um, malfeasance is because not that many people know about those policies and they're still going by the old rule of thumb, but we are seeing some examples. And we're also seeing, and so, I'm sorry, I just want to be clear, that's not a claim about the malfeasance of trans people particularly, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's a claim about yeah. the malfeasance of males yeah. whether or not they're trans, that statistically some proportion of them will be, uh, will have, you know, sinister intentions. Right. So um, what we're also seeing is fear, anxiety, a uh, loss of privacy, uh, you know, a kind of um, a real anti-democratic move to radically change these spaces. And men are not going to notice this as much because it's not, trans men <laughs> you know no, no. identifying their way into male bathrooms or changing rooms half as much and 
the threat isn't there for, for men. You know, they're not worried about what would happen if that did become commonplace. So um, that's the space issue. And then the, the free speech issue is related. Of course, women are more worried about this. They want to speak out about it more. It's their category above all that seems to be shifting rather than a kind of stepwise um, yeah. movement. And and it's easier to tell women to shut up, <laughs> you know. Mm. So mm. Uh, I'm, both women and men do this. I'm not saying it's men that are telling them to shut up. I'm fairly sure that that Abate example you mentioned will be there'll be women involved in in monstering this poor woman. But but it is easier if you've got a choice between um, trying to shut down a man's speech and a woman's speech. I would say strategically you might as well go for the woman's because society will help you in that. I think as well people are pure p- passionately. You know, when they are presented with the way in which the language is being changed, particularly by the bureaucracy, if you like, uh, in the way that now we talk, we hear people with cervixes, people who menstruate. It's it's almost like women are being, you know, the whole idea of a woman is is somehow or other being traduced. Yeah, I mean, that that kind of shift. So is purely based on this kind of fantasized projection onto trans people, mainly by non-trans people, that, that, that if they hear any reference at all to womanhood or manhood, like, you know, any kind of general claim like women have periods, they will, you know, trans men will feel affronted and maybe even trans women too, you know, because they mm-hmm. can't have them. So now we need to sort of change the language to, to avo- avoid the affront. And that's just a crazy practice yeah. because we need language for more purposes than avoiding a front we need clear communication in health for people that don't understand what a cervix is but they do know what a woman or a female is for instance yeah. Yeah. um it's an inc- exceptionally sort of middle class university derived mm. movement this mm. and it's not really thinking about how these changes impact on people who don't understand this gender studies stuff um but also it's just kind of profoundly stupid because people with the cervix is no less biological, <laughs> you know, as a descriptor. It's arguably more reductive and more mm. um, dehumanising um, mm. and certainly yes. doesn't yes. take you out of the biological realm. So I just think the whole thing's preposterous. Mm. Yes. One thing that was a, I found extraordinary in your book was the number of people who identify now as being trans, having shot up. I mean, I think it's around about 2004, 2,000 to 500, 2,000 to 5,000, something like that in the UK. And I think in 2018 it is, Kathleen, it was something like, uh, well, Stonewall says 600,000, the government says up to 500,000. I mean, you know, what do we make of those figures? Is, is that just simply because the argument and the terms of reference have changed or what? It's it's partly that because originally um, the numbers were based on assumptions about who would apply and get a gender, rec- gender recognition certificate. Um, and it was assumed that there would be some meaningful, what, what they call meaningful social transition, which, you know, I don't think changes your sex, but it does may change your body surgically through injecting hormones over a long period of time or having your genitalia reconstructed. Um, and it would involve cross-dressing and things like that. Now, again, when the move, the sort of activist focus became gender identity then it automatically expanded the category because you don't have to be doing those things anymore it's just a matter of how you feel how you describe yourself to others and it includes this new category not thought of i don't know by many 30 years ago um which is non-binary people and it's Mm. a you know it's a a trend amongst younger people to describe themselves as non-binary they don't want she or he pronouns they want to be described as they or some other kind of made-up pronoun. Um, and that's that's expanded the category enormously. Of course, it suits Stonewall to say that there has been a huge increase in mm. trans people mm. because then they can get some um, cred- credibility for their project there. But um, it's definitely... This huge category now contains people of very different kinds. You know, it contains young, same-sex attracted girls and boys who are now describing themselves as non-binary or as trans 
and they may be transitioning for completely different reasons to 50 year old heterosexual males who are married who continue to be married to a woman um and who now cross dress in public you know those are different demographics mm. and i think we need mm. different understanding of those but they're being pushed together in this big category and the, the common fact is supposed to be gender identity gender identity uh so basically with non-binary it's sort of what we used to call, call uh what bisexual or no, unisex or what no? no no it's not about sexual orientation although that's um in there somewhere but um it's about feeling that you neither i i mean this is, i use the words of the activists or, or stonewall's definitions but roughly um you neither identify as a woman or a man oh i see so you're you're androgynous or you identify with androgyny as a kind of ideal um psychologically uh, you don't feel you fit firmly in one category or another. You maybe you feel you fit in both. So it's something like that. Isn't it? You need have nothing to do with sexuality. Sexuality is another set of identities now that you can add on, as it were, but they can cross, um, cross cut. So basically, somebody like Sam Smith recently calling himself non-binary, and therefore he's referred to as they. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, they uh, yes. <laughs> They are referred to as they, <laughs> yes. Right. Um, I mean, Kathleen, I, I'm sure you, we're both gay people. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are consequences too for gay people in this, aren't there? Well, absolutely. Because although I said, you know, bisexuality and non-binaryness is not the same category conceptually, it's, um, there, are, there are multiple effects that this is having on gay people, um, partly because the the group is now understood as the LGBT. So, um, yeah. again, the, the the relevant differences between those groups are not are just being completely ignored. But the obvious difference is um, that same sex attracted people are precisely the clue is in the name attracted to people as of the same sex as themselves. Now that's a reference to sex twice: your sex <laughs> and the yeah. sex of the people that you are interested in. Yeah. <clears throat> as um, trans activism tries to evacuate our language of reference to sex it wants to replace that with gender identity so now being gay is a matter of having a gender identity that's the same as the gender identity of the people you're attracted to which leaves us with the absurd conclusion that um, a male who transitions who, be who becomes a trans woman but who stays in in my terminology heterosexual that is stably attracted to females can count as a lesbian. So, because right. right. yeah, they've yeah. got a female gender identity and the people they're attracted mm. to allegedly have female gender identities. Mm. So we have this new phenomenon of trans women describing themselves as lesbians. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, again, we've lost the word to refer to the original phenomenon. Mm. And this has practical negative consequences um, in terms of protecting the rights of gay people as originally understood. And also, I think, specifically in the area of young people, um, mm. because young people who are trying to get to grips with their own sexuality are now being told, you know, there's a possibility at least that they are trans. They are in the wrong body. Maybe they're a boy in a girl's body or a girl in a boy's body. And it turns out that this is more likely to happen or these feelings are, are more likely for you if you are gay. Right. Right. So there's a high, you know, we're hearing from the Tavistock Gender Identity Service that one of the sort of predisposing factors to turning up in that clinic as a child or adolescent is if you are same sex attracted. So that's one obvious knock on effect. Because And this has gone, sorry, Kathleen, that's, this has gone up usually too, hasn't it? Uh, young people presenting to the NHS, uh, I think it's gender development, uh, it's gone up for for girls particularly to fight by five thousand percent. Yes, it's gone up hugely. Um, again, modern trans activist gives us no opportunity to ask why that's happening. The story is unrelentingly positive. They are they should be affirmed. Mm. They are really boys, or they are really not girls. Um, and it turns out that again, predisposing factors may be being gay or being autistic or having trauma, a history of trauma. So there's lots of complicated stuff going on there and they are not well served by an activism which um, says that any discussion of that is bigotry, that we must affirm these, these 
kids. Um, and we're seeing also the effects of this because there are now de- what are called detransitioners, that is people at a relatively young age who made decisions to alter their bodies or at least to change their whole social persona. And um, the ones who took testosterone or who had their ovaries removed or their breasts removed um, or had full hysterectomies in their early 20s or teen, late teens even, um, are profoundly distressed now that the mists have cleared and they've realised that this was just a phase for them and that nobody really told them (laughs) that this would be a phase because the surrounding rhetoric is so affirmative and positive and anyone who disagrees with you is a hater and a bigot. So this is just disastrous, um, particularly impacting on on lesbians again, who, you know, and butch lesbians in particular. Um, And then another aspect of that impacts on gay people, gay young people, is this, what I just mentioned, that trans women describing themselves as lesbians, there is a sort of really unpleasant aspect of activism, which is saying your preferences for the same sex as you are transphobic so you should open your mind to the possibility if you're a lesbian you should open your mind to the possibility of sleeping with a trans woman who is also a lesbian like you even though they've got a penis and (laughs) you know they're male so that's that's really against the grain of their sexual orientation and that that's appalling too (laughs) but again not being talked about so one thing that uh, always has struck me about this as well is that there's a very regressive nature to some of this because, um, you know, there was a case recently, it was, it was in the papers and it was on, on television of a, a, a little girl who said she wanted to be a, she was a boy, 18 months old, I think, and the parents were being very affirmative about this. But the fact is, is that the, the old position used to be, why should girls just always like pink? And why should boys always like blue? And what if a boy wants to play with dolls anyway? Now, the fact is, you know, now we sort of gone back to a kind of almost Victorian idea that this must mean that therefore they are actually, a boy who does that must therefore be a, a, a girl in a boy's body. And we've gone back to that situation, which is one, that. Gay people fought against. Yes. You know? Yes. It's tragic because um, I don't think I saw, I think you might be talking about a child that was on this morning and was also yeah. in the paper. I think they were four. I mean, obviously, far too early to take anything they say about this seriously. I mean, children are forming their concepts of the world at this point. They, um, mm. There's no reason to think at all that they have access, stable access to womanhood and manhood and girlhood and boyhood such that they know that they are not Mm. that but so it's really just the projections of parents and educators at that age I think around a child um and possibly some anxiety about gender uh, what I would say sex (laughs) non-conformity because I Mm. hate the word gender Mm. now it's just so so confusing but um yes you're right ultimately when you um ask or read the narratives of trans people and I think there's nothing wrong with this they say, you know, how did you know that you were a woman in a man's body? Or how did you know you were a man in a woman's body? It will, it will be things like, well, I, the man will say, I liked makeup. I always played with the Barbies. I felt at home with the girls rather than the boys. Mm. You mm. know, and that's, I completely understand those feelings. It's nothing to criticise those feelings. But the, for the culture to say, oh, OK, well, in that case, that's what makes you a woman is, of course, mm. completely regressive. Um and I, I think it's just tragic that parents, like the parents of that child, are taking this new religion on authority. You know, they're mm. not, they, we can't expect everyone to think this through for themselves, you know, or like to know. If somebody tells them, if, if schools and teachers tell that child, mm. you're a boy, mm. you know, I, of course this sort of thing's going to happen. You have had your fair share of people, uh, you know, getting at you, haven't you, Cathy, for, for the things that you have said and done. I mean, what, what, is the, what, what, what form has that taken? Um, well, it's uh, taken multiple forms. I mean, I, I stress that I mention this because I think people who are listening should take this as representative of what happens to anyone in British universities, mm. any woman in particular, 
who tries to say the things I've said. So it's not, it's really an instructive tale and not, I'm not just mm. complaining, but I have had um, highly unusually virulent pushback to my relatively, you know, measured <laughs> attempting at being as respectful as possible sort of argument. So um, I've had open several open letters against me or against publications that have um, published me. I've had, uh, you know, multiple forms of local harassment, as it were, um, to do with students or, or faculty in my own um, mm. university. I've had um, people withdrawing from... Uh, academic events if they know I'm there or else no platforming me asking me to withdraw once it's discovered or um, or is people go complain to the organizers about it um I've had that I've there's been a volume dropped by an academic publisher at Oxford uh partly on the basis that I would be in it <laughs> mm. you know so this mm. all adds up over time mm. um mm. Mm. and uh it's not good for the state of free discussion about these very no. i think important social issues that we are now facing that it takes you know quite a lot of nerve yeah to keep going <laughs> yeah how is it sort of uh, how do you do that actually personally i mean i know you were you were talking there about this kind of thing uh, look on this channel you know we've talked to many different people who, uh, certainly in the academic world so what you're saying is is in fact very much what they've experienced in different ways, um, you know. So I absolutely understand that. But how do you uh, keep going? I mean, you know, you've written you've written this book here, which I I think it, this is presumably doing well, is it? I hope it is. It's doing um, really well. Yes. I mean, at one point, about five days after it was released, it was number eleven in the hardback nonfiction chart for the UK. So well, right. I think that's doing pretty well. Pleased, uh, that must be uh, something actually that yeah. uh, <laughs> really does act as a boost. Um, <laughs> Kathleen, I mean. Thank you so much for coming and uh, talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know that people will be very, very interested. We'll, we'll get a lot of feedback on, on this, I'm sure. The, the book is actually called, say, Material Girls, Why Reality Matters to Feminism by Kathleen Stock. Um, I couldn't recommend it more highly. Um, thanks very much, Kathleen. And um, all the very best to you and keep it up. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. Uh, that's it for So What You're Saying Is this week, and uh, we shall see you again next time. Thank you very much.